Hello, everyone. This is Elisa Baum, Grid Gains Director of Product Marketing. We'll begin in just a moment, but first I need to conduct a bit of housekeeping. Please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know that you can hear me. And let me take a look. I see hands. Perfect. Next, during this webinar, you will be on mute. Should you have any questions during the discussion, please enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of the webinar, we will take time to answer as many questions as possible. And um, we will probably reach out to those that we don't get to uh, personally. I would like to thank you for attending today's webinar, Superpower Apache Cassandra for Extreme OLTP Workloads. It's being presented today, uh, jointly presented actually, by Principal Solutions Architect Rachel Pedreshi, and she's from Gridgain. And also, um, we have Senior Solutions Architect Igor Rudyak from EPM Systems. He'll be doing the demo portion. And then at the end of the presentation, the Q&A session will be conducted by Rachel again. So with that said, I'll go ahead and turn the floor over to Rachel. Go ahead, Rachel. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, as Elisa mentioned, my name is Rachel Podreski, and I am a solutions architect with Grid Gain Systems. Um, Igor Rudyak is, uh, joins me um, as the connector, and he will be showing us a bit of a demo of how to get Ignite um, working with Cassandra and what type of results you're going to get. But before we get to that good stuff, you're going to have to listen to me um, prattle on about um, what we're, um, what is all this about. And uh, as a little background, uh, I've joined uh, GridGain, and very recently, uh, GridGain is the commercial vendor behind the Apache Ignite project. We'll talk a little bit more about Apache Ignite in a little bit. But previous to my work at GridGain, I was a solutions architect and evangelist for Apache Cassandra. So for those out there who are familiar with Cassandra, you might have seen me in various presentations or webinars or training videos on how to use a Cassandra. Um, I've probably worked with hundreds of customers, um, helping them with their deployments. Um, um, across the world over the last four years. And Cassandra, uh, for the most part, is a really, really fantastic um, NoSQL database. It does certain things incredibly well, um, including the ability to be always available and never down. Uh, Multi-data center replication and um, uh, the ability to um, have uh, your data anywhere is works incredibly well with Cassandra. But, um, as all good things do, it's not perfect, and I do have a, a few slides um, out there in the internet saying that, you know, Cassandra is not necessarily um, the, the unicorn that uh, you are looking for. So, with all the goodness of Cassandra, there is some complexity. And the complexity comes from how Cassandra has to store data on disk. Cassandra was designed to uh, read and write data sequentially off disk, and the reason why it was done that what was done that way was because moving disk heads around on spinning disk is slow. So if you configure your data correctly, if you model it correctly, you can make Cassandra read and wrap, write very very fast and not move that head as the disk spins. And the same thing works for SSDs as well. It uh, minimizes the amount of disk seek and therefore um, uh, keeps your SSDs working um, better for you longer. What Cassandra is not designed for, though, is memory. It does use memory tables uh, for its writes. And if you happen to be lucky and your read comes through while it's still a mem table, great. But 90% of the time, it's going to read data off of disk. So one of the things that's a, a consequence of that are slow reads. Uh, Cassandra read latency, as I saw with a number of clients, is typically in the one to five millisecond uh, range in the 50th percentile. And for some of my clients, uh, they had very, very tight SLAs, especially in the telecom and ad serving industries, where Five, second, five milliseconds in the uh, 50th just wasn't going to cut it. 
even one millisecond in the 50th wasn't going to cut it. And potentially long GC pauses causing some reads to go, you know, in the 95th to go into the hundreds of milliseconds. This wasn't going to this wasn't going to be success, um, acceptable for them. The other thing that people were uh, find a tad frustrating with Cassandra is due to the strict nature of how you model the data, you do not have a lot of flexibility around your queries. You can write very very simple queries, but there are no joins, there are no group eyes, there are no aggregates. All those. You know, all those normal SQL things are verboten in, in Cassandra. And, you know, you work around it, you model your data, you duplicate data in order to um, fulfill the different types of queries. Um, friends don't let friends use secondary indexes, but that was an option. Uh, Datastax Enterprise gives you the ability to use Spark or Solar, but those are you know, third-party technologies that are, are placed on top of Cassandra. Not exactly what you're looking for, especially if you just want to stay in the open source realm. So putting Ignite and Cassandra actually solves those two problems, and I like to say they're, they're better together. So first off, let's talk about the memory portion. Uh, memory over the last few years has dropped in price uh, dramatically, and there are some really exciting new technologies coming from Intel and HP and uh, Micron on um, um, less expensive, high density um, RAM options. They're called phase chains, and some other like technologies. And allows you to be able to put um, multiple terabytes of RAM on your machines at a much, much lower cost than was av available previously. Um, this has led Gartner to say that you know in memory will have an industry impact comparable to web and cloud, and that RAM is the new disk and disk is the new tape. Uh, just as far as the technology goes, RAM is going to be about a thousand times faster than disk in general, and that is mostly due to the I/O chain and the demarshalling um, objects on and off a disk is incredibly expensive. So if you are going to be creating a new application that is designed for the web and cloud that's going to be um, incredibly modern, you might be looking at Cassandra because of if it's always on abilities. But it is a disk first or disk optimized data store. Putting a, um, Apache Ignite, which is a memory first data store, uh, allevi uh, um, alleviates some of those, uh, alleviates that requirement. So a little bit about Apache Ignite, I've mentioned it a few times, if you're not familiar with it already. Um, it was started um, actually as the grid gain um, project back in 2007. And it was donated in 2014 to Apache and uh, graduated to a top level project in about a year and a half, the second fastest um, before Spark. So it is actually a very, very mature project, even though it um, is fairly new to the Apache Foundation. Um, it has a number of committers all over the world, an active community, and um, over a million lines of code and a number of features. Uh, we do not have time today to talk about all the features that Apache Ignite um, provides, um, but all that is available on the GridGain website. And there are some number of uh, webinars. I had one earlier this month on using this for data warehouse workloads. And there's a number of others on other types of workloads that you can use with Apache Ignite. So how does it work architecturally? Very if you are a Cassandra user, this is probably a very high level version of your architecture. You have some type of application. And it reads and writes out of your Cassandra cluster. Pretty straightforward. You might have Kafka in there. You may have, you know, some other clients. But for the most part, this is what what you're looking at. Ignite actually slides in between Cassandra and your application. So your application no longer um, reads and writes out of Cassandra. It will read and write out of Ignite. Then Ignite itself handles the read and write out of Cassandra. And this is the connector that my, uh, my co-presenter, Igor, has, has built and he'll be um, talking to you about in a little bit. 
So first off, um, Ignite is an in-memory technology. Um, it um, has two uh, separate in-memory modes, uh, key value and file system. We're going to be worrying more about the key value system um, today. Now, some people might say, well, key value, that's not flexible. That just gives me the same um, problems as no SQL. But actually, key value is a very, very flexible system that allows for a lot of different types of queries on top of it. More importantly, though, because this is an in-memory key value system, you don't um, need to the you have a lot more uh, speed and flexibility about how you use those key values because you don't have to pull data on and off of disk. All the in, um, it, Ignite also includes um, indexes, which are also in memory. Ignite, like Cassandra, is always available. So it is a cluster of nodes that um, you are uh, you can design you can define as primary and as many backups as you need. All the nodes are peers, and if a node goes down, uh, your application continue to read to any of the the backups that have been defined. The uh, a, pr a, a node will actually get any of its if it does go down, will get its data back from backup nodes, and Ignite will. Um, redistribute data as your cluster shrinks and grows for you. There's also a multi data set center replication option that's available through GridGain, the GridGain Enterprise Project product, and also um, split brain um, support. So you can architect your system to be just as always available as your Cassandra system with Ignite. Sorry about that. Need to froze up for a second. Ignite is also scalable. So as you uh, first horizontally scalable, as you add new nodes to your cluster, you will have more memory in order to cache your data out of Cassandra. So it's linear scalable like Cassandra. Add nodes, add capacity. It is also vertically scalable because you can, you will, we will use all the memory that you have on your nodes, not just your JVM memory. So you can define your objects to live on or off heap and utilize all the memory that you have um, on your machines. It's also fully SQL 99, uh, consistent in the acid in the acid sense of the word. Has ODBC drivers and JDBC drivers. So this is where you're able to write any type of OLAP or complex query. Um, Igor's going to show you an example of this in a little bit against Cassandra data because it now lives in Apache Ignite. So it's an Apache Ignite in memory and also fully SQL 99 compliant and can be 100% ACID, um, consistent in the ACID sense. You can also keep it eventually consistent like in Cassandra. I do have a blog post out there someplace on the difference in the consistency, what consistency means between ACID and CAP and how those two things play out in Ignite. If you're interested in reading more about that or you need a good uh, uh, bedtime, uh, bedtime story to help you sleep. Also Ignite um, allows for the data to stay the same. So there's no, nece no need to rip and replace. You don't need to remodel your data. Um, Ignite uh, will actually read off the relational databases just as well as will read off Cassandra and SQL databases. And you don't need to change the schema at all. It will all go directly into Ignite as is. Now this makes it a, a possible solution for people who are actually considering moving to Cassandra, but the whole idea of re-data modeling their system, which Cassandra requires, is a bit daunting or might take some time. So you can actually use Ignite on your relational database, change your application to interface with Ignite, and then, re, um, and then slowly migrate your relational database to Cassandra, and your application will see no difference um, if it goes through Ignite. Ignite can be completely, um, can be uh, totally heterogeneous as far as NoSQL um, uh, relational databases, and Hadoop as well. 
So if you're using any of these in your ecosystem, you can, you can use Ignite to speed any of them up. You can also use this with Spark um, and uh, use the actual the Ignite file system to pin your RDDs into memory. Again, either using data from Cassandra, from Hadoop, or a relational database. So that's the, the quick overview of how of what Ignite is and how it works um, with Cassandra. Next up, we are going to be uh, doing a, a short demo. Um, Igor is going to show you a, um, how Ignite works with Cassandra. The demo environment is going to include 20 nodes of Cassandra, um, 3.x, three nodes of Ignite, and three nodes of a data generation, which gets about 6,500 orders per second. So the idea is it's going to be an Amazon-style web store where data is flowing in um, for, from the test generation nodes through Ignite and persisted into Cassandra. They're, um, these are virtual machines. They're not particularly uh, beefy nodes, um, but we're going to be, we wanted to show you an idea of the performance uh, gains you're going to get with um, Ignite on top of Cassandra and some of the flexibilities you get with queries. So first some OLTP queries and some OLAP queries. So I'm going to turn um, everything over to Igor now and while he um, gets this set up. All right, I think the ball is in your, your court. Take it away, Igor. Oh, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Igor Rudiak, and Rachel already introduced myself. I'm solution architect with EPAM Systems. Uh, just want to add that uh, the idea of this Ignite Cassandra integration model, uh, it was introduced by uh, my colleague, Alexander Budnik. He's a rather well-known person in the memory computing world. Uh, yeah, and I'm the guy who implemented this idea. Uh, okay, uh, in this demo I'm going to show you simple uh, emulation of uh, online web store and uh, uh, I'm going to use this uh, Ignite Cassandra integration model and just uh, as Rachel explained you, it works uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, once we put our data into Ignite, it will be automatically stored in Cassandra as well. And uh, it also works opposite way. As far as our RAM, it's limited resource. We can't uh, store all our data in RAM. So uh, some portion of data we have in Cassandra, but we don't have it in Ignite. Uh, so once you ask for such data uh, for Ignite, uh, it will uh, transfer this uh, request to Cassandra, get this data from Cassandra, put it into its in-memory cache, and after that, uh, return it to you. If you'll ask for the same data second time, uh, this query it will be served from in-memory cache, and it will be uh, extremely fast. Uh, okay, uh, let's first look what we have here in Cassandra. Uh, here we have uh, two tables. We have product table, uh, the main purpose of which to store our list of products which uh, we are going to sell, and this is the attributes of it, ID, description, price, title type, uh, pretty straightforward, and it's partitioned by uh, ID field, and uh, there are no clustering columns here. And we have another table, order, uh, that's the table where we are going to store uh, all our orders which we receiving and it also has its own set of columns like ID, uh, amount of uh, a specific product which was ordered, day when this uh, order was created, uh, day millisecond, that's a special field, I'll uh, describe it uh, a bit later. Uh, price, uh, that's the summary price of the order, and uh, product ID, that's the reference to our product. Uh, okay, and uh, we have absolutely same tables, or in Ignite we call them caches. Uh, let me show them to you. Uh, 
I'm using a uh, GDBC driver for Ignite and from this screen I'm just going to uh, make some kind of uh, SQL queries. So this is our order cache and in this cache we just have, now we just have only one order. I just created it in advance. These fields starting from underscore, this is system fields and here we have the same set of uh, columns like in our Cassandra table and we also have our product table here. Uh, let me show it to you. That's our products and uh, we have I think about something about uh, 30,000 products here. Uh, yeah, okay, almost 30,000 products. Okay, uh, just uh, as a first example, let's do the most typical query in Cassandra. Uh, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to select only one order by its ID. And you remember that ID, that's the uh, partition key for uh, this order and uh, also primary key. So it should be rather fast. Uh, okay, it took something like one second, 300 milliseconds, and again, uh, uh, performance is not so fast because uh, I'm using virtual machines and uh, I'm also using VPN connection uh, to these virtual machines, and uh, because of this, uh, you can see such not probably uh, very high speed. Okay, let's do the same query three times. Okay, uh, again, one second, 30, 300 milliseconds, uh, okay, the same thing. So, uh, an average, it's something like one second, 300 milliseconds to uh, obtain one record from order stable by its ID. Uh, let's do the same thing with Ignite. Uh, for Ignite, I just need to slightly modify table name. Okay. Wow, and <laughs> it returned immediately. Okay, what's the time? Uh, let's do the same thing. Let's try it three times. Wow, okay. Probably first time it just took to reestablish the connection to Ignite, and uh, for Ignite it took something like uh, 200 milliseconds. Uh, and uh, that's actually rather expected because uh, Ignite it's 100% uh, in memory system and all these queries they just served from memory. But in Cassandra when you're doing query like this uh, uh, it's, it always involves some portion of disk input output because of course you have such option like uh, uh, row level cache in Cassandra but it's not recommended and I'm not using it here. Uh, okay, uh, that's the first sample. Uh, now let's look at the infrastructure I'm using. Uh, what we have here. Here we have our Cassandra cluster of 20 nodes. Uh, and uh, I'm using just very simple primitive virtual machines. can show it to you. That's the typical configuration of my virtual machines. Three cores, 16 gigs. Uh, actually 15 gigs of RAM. And uh, what else? I have my Ignite cluster of three nodes and again same, con same configuration of uh, virtual machines, four cores, 15 gigs of RAM and uh, I also have uh, this test cluster. Uh, the purpose of this guy is to generate load for these two guys, Ignite and Cassandra, and uh, as Rachel explained in her picture, uh, this test cluster, it uh, will be like a client and all the load, it will go from here to Ignite and uh, Ignite will uh, transparently store all the data in Cassandra. Now let's uh, put some load on this system. I have these three nodes and on these nodes, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to start some kind of load tests for this system. Okay. 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 
Uh, and uh, on each of these three nodes, I have, uh, I'm using eight threads, so three multiplying eight, it will be uh, 24 threads uh, generating load for this system in parallel. And uh, as far as I'm using uh, virtual machines, uh, I expect it to take some time at the beginning to warm them up, uh, and uh, after that they will uh, show better performance because, yeah, now they show in such ingestion speed, it's actually about uh, five times slower than I expected. Uh, but mm, anyway, uh, wow. <laughs> Let's look what we <laughs> can do the, with these uh, virtual machines and just let's check how many orders we already injected into our system. I'm going to close all these tabs and uh, okay. Uh, forty eight thousand orders, not too much. Yeah, we definitely need to wait for. Uh, better speed. Uh, from my previous experience, it took about uh, one to two minutes for these virtual machines to warm them up, and after that, that they start showing uh, better speed. That's just uh, depends on the hypervisor configuration on the bare metal servers where these virtual machines host. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's look at the monitoring dashboard. Maybe we can see something interesting here. Mm, yeah, as for now, we just see that uh, we don't have <laughs> too much load for Cassandra and for Ignite cluster as well. Uh, just need to wait for some time. Okay. Yeah, you just never know when you are uh, working with virtual machines. You uh, never know what to expect. Uh, so uh, I'm just waiting for them to warm up and start showing uh, significantly better ingestion speed. And again, I'm expecting uh, for it to take about uh, one, maximum two minutes. Yeah, but. I never know, maybe some other portion of virtual machine. Oh, yeah. Uh, now things going better. Okay, and let's look. Okay, now we have about uh, 180 messages per second per one thread. And okay, here, and uh, let's look what we have here. Okay, so uh, in average, now we have about 100. 80 messages per second per one thread, and you remember I have three three test nodes and eight threads for each node, so uh, 180 multiplying three multiplying eight. Uh, that's our ingestion speed right now. Uh, almost uh, uh, four and a uh, half thousand messages per second. Um, let's look how many orders we already ingested. Okay, uh, almost uh, 500,000 orders already ingested. Uh, let's wait uh, until we have 1 million orders and after that I'll, uh, I'll go in to show you something interesting. And uh, I think now we also may look at this monitoring dashboard. Just let me refresh it. Uh, oh yeah, uh, now you can see that we have such rather significant load for our Cassandra cluster. You can also see this on this graph, uh, but uh, Ignite uh, just doing well because, again, uh, that's rather expected situation because uh, this layer, it's 
absolutely uh, 100 in memory layer, everything in memory. Uh, there is absolutely no disk input output here. All our disk input output is here in Cassandra. Uh, that's why we can see such spikes here in Cassandra and we don't see such spikes in Ignite. Uh, okay, uh, let's check once again how many orders we already have. Okay, I uh, think we need to wait for 10 or something like that. Second cent, after that we'll have uh, 1 million orders. <laughs> and that's our ingestion speed right now. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, we are very, very close to 1 million. Uh, and let me just show you again before I start my next example how many products we have in our web store. Uh, 30,000 products and again number of orders. 1 million. Yeah, now we have 1 million. Okay, uh, now I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to execute this select query and it will take some time while it's executing. I'll try to explain uh, what I'm going to do here. Uh, in this query I'm interested in top 10 uh, most selling projects right now uh, by the amount of products which were sold. And what we have here? Here we have a join of two tables, product table and order table. Actually, in reality, we don't need this join because uh, we have this product ID field in our order table, but I just put uh, this join here to make situation even worse. Uh, also have such uh, expensive operation like group by, and another expensive operation like order by. Okay, wow, we already have the results and it took 33 seconds. Okay, just let's think about this, 33 seconds. We have uh, such amount of products. Uh, if I'll just multiply it by amount of orders. Wow, that's rather big number. Let's look at it. Okay, uh, that's 30 billion. What does it mean? Uh, if you go to do this join most straightforward way, you have to do these 30 billion comparison operations. Uh, but fortunately, Ignite doesn't do it such way because in Ignite we have such things like indexes and these two fields, they have indexes on top of them and uh, we have significantly less amount of operations. But for example, if you'll try to do the same thing in MapReduce or Spark, uh, you may have uh, problems with this because, for example, Spark, it doesn't have any idea of indexes and it will use full scan to join these two data sets. Uh, but this join is actually not the end of the story. Uh, here we also have this group by, which is expensive operation, and order by, and all these just took uh, 33 seconds. Oh, by the way, it's also not the end of the story. Uh, at the same time when this query was executing, uh, we still kept receiving our orders. You see, I didn't uh, turn off our ingestion. Uh, okay, uh, let's look uh, again how many orders we already ingested into our system. Uh, about a million and a half. Okay, uh, let's wait for two millions and after that I'm going to show you something even more interesting and uh, while we waiting for uh, two millions uh, I'm going to explain in more details uh, the next case I'm going to show you. 
you remember that uh, uh, we, memory in Ignite, even if it's uh, distributed in memory system, it's rather limited resource, so uh, we just store some uh, limited portion, I can say, the most fresh data, uh, we store it in Ignite, but for all historical data, we use such storage like Cassandra. And that's the benefit which you can get from Cassandra, because, uh, for example, uh, in the next case, I'm going to show you how we can uh, download portion of historical data from Cassandra into another Ignite cache, and after that, uh, we can play with uh, most recent uh, data, and some historical data we can make kind of analytics with this uh, data, uh, but uh, to download uh, historical data from Cassandra, I need to uh, repartition it uh, slightly another way. Uh, let's say, for example, today it's uh, 13th of September, and uh, I'm interested in all the orders which were created months ago, 13th of August. So I'm going to download uh, into another Ignite cache, all the orders from Cassandra which were created at the uh, 13th of August. If I'll try to use product table for this, that's probably not the best solution, because uh, to do this I just need to make a full scan, and it will be very, very slow. And uh, the approach which we are using uh, for such kind of things in Cassandra, we just need to denormalize our data or repartition it slightly another way. Uh, so for such kind of things, I have materialized view in Cassandra built on top of this uh, product table, and it's partitioned by these, uh, let, oh, sorry, not product, order, uh, excuse me, and it's partitioned by this day millisecond field. Let me explain it in more details. Uh, just let me check how many orders we already ingested. Okay, we have two millions. Let me terminate all these slot tests because uh, we need our Cassandra uh, cluster for the next example. I just wanted to recover from this, uh, yeah, very, very high load. Okay, uh, what is this day millisecond field, uh, which uh, I, I'm using to uh, partition my data in order history materialized view? Uh, let me explain it in more details. Uh, just do this. Okay. Okay. Uh, here is one record from this materialized view, and uh, this materialized view it uh, has absolutely the same data as this uh, order table. It's slightly another partitioned, slightly another way. Uh, here we have as a partition key this day millisecond column and as a clustering column ID of our order, and in day millisecond, that's a string field. Here, as a prefix, uh, we have uh, the day when this order was created. Uh, and uh, the last part of this field, that's the millisecond when this order was created. So, taking into account that you have uh, 1,000 uh, milliseconds per second, it means that uh, you have 1,000 partitions per day in your Cassandra table. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, for example, if you'll have uh, 1 billion orders per day, uh, dividing it by uh, 1,000 partitions, this means that you have 1,000 orders per one partition, um, which is okay for Cassandra. And, of course, these, all these orders, they will be more or less evenly distributed among uh, uh, Cassandra partitions. Okay, and now the second part of the question, uh, what's uh, the most efficient way to uh, download uh, data from all these uh, solvent Cassandra partitions into Ignite cache? 
And uh, I'm going to show this to you. Uh, here I'm going to use very simple Java code. And while it's executing, I'll try to explain more details about this. Uh, OK. Um, you remember that in Cassandra, for each day, we have these 1,000 partitions. And uh, in Ignite, we have uh, our three Ignite nodes. On each node, I configured thread pool of eight threads. So we have, in summary, 24 threads. And we are going to use these 24 threads to download data from these 1,000 Cassandra partitions. But how can we do this? Uh, OK. In Ignite, we also have such concept like uh, partitions for our caches. And each node in Ignite, uh, it's responsible for some set of uh, partitions from the partition range for particular cache. And by default, uh, each cache, it has uh, 1,024 partitions. So the idea is pretty simple. We can just map these uh, 1,024 Ignite partitions to 1,000 Cassandra partitions in such a way. Uh, one Ignite node, it will be responsible for downloading data from some subset of uh, uh, 1,000 partitions in Cassandra. Mm, OK, uh, actually, it's already completed. And here, I, I just go into explain more details about this code. Uh, the main method here is uh, load cache. This order history, that's the instance of our Ignite cache. And that's the special method I'm using to warm up this cache. And as a parameter, I specified this query here. Um, you see in this query, I'm querying this uh, order history materialized view. And uh, here I specified as the prefix uh, the day. It's uh, 13th of August. And this variable on uh, Ignite node site, it will be substituted with the Ignite partition number. Uh, this particular node responsible for, as far as each node it responsible from for some range of partitions on Ignite nodes, such one SQL query, it will be transferred for number of SQL queries for each of the partition this Ignite node responsible for. And all these uh, SQL queries, they will be executed in parallel, actually. Not all of them. I have just only eight threads in my thread pool. But anyway, we'll use uh, all these uh, 24 threads to uh, load our data from Cassandra. And okay, it took okay, it took 24 sec, uh, 26 seconds to download our historical data. And here in Ignite, I have such cache for this order history. Let's look how many orders we have there. OK, we have uh, 500,000 orders in our order history cache. And again, just let me close these tabs and clean this screen. And in our order table, where we store the most recent orders, we have 2 millions. Uh, now, let's do the most interesting thing. Let me execute this query. And it will take some time for it to complete. And uh, while it's executing, I'll try to explain what I'm going to do here. Uh, here in this query, I'm interested in top 10 products uh, which have uh, the most positive um, selling dynamic comparing to the situation which I had months ago. Or uh, to explain it even more easily, uh, I'm interested in top 10 products uh, which have uh, the most uh, positive increase in the amount of products which were sold comparing to the situation which I had month ago at the 13th of August. And 
again, what we have here, we join in two rather big tables. Uh, we join in order history and order table. Uh, you remember that here we have 500,000 records and here we have 2 millions. So if we'll just multiply these two numbers and 2 million. Oh, wow, that's that's rather big number. Uh, let's look at this number. Okay, guys, uh, this is billion, but this this is trillion. So what does it mean? Again, if you'll try to do this join uh, using the most straightforward approach, uh, you'll have to do one trillion comparison operations. But again, uh, I have indexes uh, built on top of these two fields and it will take significantly less amount of operations. Um, but in addition to this join, here we also have this uh, rather expensive group by operation. Uh, and again, that's not the end of our story. We have also such uh, rather expensive operation like order by, which we need to take these uh, uh, top 10 products. Uh, let's look at our monitoring dashboard, what we have right now. Let me refresh it. Okay, yeah, now we can see that uh, Cassandra doing well, absolutely no load for Cassandra, and as for Ignite, yeah, it also feels not bad, and you may, you may find such a significant spike here on network graph in Ignite, so previously you may see that we have not more than uh, two megabytes per second, but now we have about uh, 25 megabytes per second was this. That's actually what we called, uh, what we call shuffling in MapReduce and Spark world. And yeah, that's uh, uh, pretty straightforward as far as we use in such join and group by and order by applica uh, uh, operations, uh, we need shuffling here. Oh, wow, and we have a results now, and let's check the time. Okay, it took only three minutes. Three minutes to join, to first of all, join two data sets, one having 500,000 records, and another data set having two million records, and also we used group by and order by. And actually that's all possible only because of two things. Uh, because everything is in memory, there are absolutely zero disk input output here. And the second thing, because we are using indexes on top of these two fields. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to show to you. And I think now it's time for questions. So if um, I did see some questions in the uh, panel, if you wanted to add questions there, that is uh, probably the easiest way um, to, to, get, um, to get them to us. Otherwise, hold on, let me put up our contact information. Oops. So there's some more information um, here um, at our website, uh, on the Apache Ignite website or on the Grid Game website. Also be sure to check out um, EPAM's website. Um, EPAM is a partner of Grid Games and does uh, consulting and implementation of a number of distributed and big data um, applications and systems. And if you um, have any questions, you're uh, welcome to send them over now. Or, uh, oh, here we go. We've got a question. Uh, let's see. How much 
Ignite is efficient for Cassandra terabytes to RAM for terabytes of Cassandra. So Cassandra, um, you don't want to put more than one to three terabytes of data per Cassandra node. Uh, that's due to you know many things within Cassandra, but um, garbage collection uh, being probably the primary uh, and compaction being the biggest issues there. With Ignite, you don't really have a limitation of how much memory besides how much you can afford, uh, but uh, you put as much memory in your Ignite cluster as you want to be able to cache. So, for cons so there's no real magic formula between the two, um, but with my experience with Cassandra, you usually more than a, no more than a terabyte of spinning and three terabytes of SSDs. Yes, your mileage may vary. Different compaction strategies will affect it in different ways. With Ignite, it's just about as much memory as you can, as much data as you want to cache is what you would give Ignite. I do actually think that we've run a little bit over. All right, if you are using active active multi data center replication with Cassandra, taking reads and writes to both data centers, would you also set up Ignite multi data center replication on that? Or would you just rely on Cassandra replicating the data underneath? And Ignite would read the data as needed from Cassandra? That's a great question. Um, I would think you could, you would go you could go either way because both uh, systems do provide for multi data center replication. I think it just depends on where you want to make sure that you have the data replicated and how your architecture is set up. So if you want to make sure that data is persisted. Uh, in multi data centers and you're going to have like a pod based architecture where you have clients connecting on both um, on both data centers then probably having both in multi data center is the right is the right move um, that being said if you if the fact that the data is cached not necessarily cached in the same place on both data centers or that um, you are not necessarily as concerned about speed for multi data center, um, that's not your primary goal for doing multi data center replication, then you probably can get away with just doing it with Cassandra. All right, I don't see any other questions, and we are out of time for this morning. If you